Hey there everybody, it's Liz with Lilac Renegade and I did say that I wanted to start doing a little bit more of like a narrative thing with my channel and so I have written a story for this week. It's based very loosely, and I do mean very loosely, on a grim fairy tale. So without further ado, I will go ahead and get started. Beric silently leaned forward and carefully, slowly moved a branch out of the way. He was focused hard on the hair that was just within range of his bow. He knew that he needed to get just a little closer to get a better shot, and the rabbit was just focused on eating. Suddenly, the hare's head shot to attention, nose twitching, and it was off like a shot through the trees. Beric's stomach growled, but it was no good. He lowered his bow and listened. He heard it too. He started to follow the sound, and as he grew closer, he knew that someone needed help. Throwing his gear over his back, he ran towards the sound, bursting out of the forest onto the riverbank. Hanging onto the bridge by one hand was a black tattered cloak, and the old woman within was yelling for help. She looked tired, and she screamed that she could not hold on for much longer. Beric was tall but he knew in order to save her, he would have to swim against the powerful current to get to her. He stripped off his pack and weapons and waded in, swimming out to save her. I got you, Beric said. Hold on to me. I will get you to the bank. Oh, thank you, sir, the old woman said. You will not regret this. Once they got to the bank, Beric got a good look at the woman he had saved. She was small and stooped, wrinkled and worn. Are you all right? he asked. Just fine, she answered. Thank you. I was worried I would be swept away. Which way are you going? Do you need to be on the other bank? I can help you across the bridge if you need. I'm headed that direction anyway, Beric offered. No, no, I'm right where I need to be. You are too kind. But I do wish to reward you for your help, the old woman answered. There is no need, Beric answered. But the old woman would not hear it. No, no, I insist, she said. But I can only give you some wisdom. Ahem. <clears throat> Forward for you, but back for me. You will find a shining magic tree. Golden leaves and silver branches. Up high lie all your chances. Seven bright blue birds are fighting over a cloak that they can never use. And one more of my wise clues. Take a golden acorn from the same bough, and you will never want for anything now. Beric politely thanked the woman and let her go on her way. As he headed home with a growling stomach, he knew the woods really well. He had never seen a tree like that. Just as he started to wonder if he should have left her alone so late in the day, he came upon a tree. There it was, a tall, straight, proud tree with a silvery trunk and golden leaves. Beric racked his brain and tried to remember what else the old woman had said. Surely this was not a magical tree, but... Oh, what else had she said? Seven bluebirds. In the setting sun, he thought he saw a flash of blue. And then another. He counted... Seven different birds of blue diving in and out of the branches of the tree. He rushed over to the trunk of the tree and looked up. In the heights of the tree branches, Beric could just make out a swatch of blue fabric hanging over a branch. So he decided to climb up, and up, and up. The birds had seen him, though, and started to dive and peck at him, but he just waved them away and focused on the cloak above him. When he reached the branch, he snatched the cloak away from the birds who just sat around and watched him loop the fabric around his shoulders. Beric heaved himself onto the branch and sat there looking down. He was not ready to climb down just yet, and it was a long way down, and he was tired and hungry. Instead, he took a moment to catch his breath, and he plucked an acorn from the branch to admire its golden color. But he was losing the light. He closed his eyes. As beautiful as that cloak was, he still wished he had gone to the tavern for a meal. He had enough copper coins. 
When Beric opened his eyes, instead of in the shining tree, he was sitting on the rock across from the tavern. He glanced around and looked down at the acorn in his hand and the cloak on his shoulders, and he just couldn't believe his eyes. No, this wasn't a dream. And unsure of exactly what had just happened, but very hungry, he slipped the golden acorn into his pocket and went in and ordered a meal and negotiated a place to sleep in the stables for a night. That night, Beric dreamt of golden leaves becoming golden coins and then becoming golden leaves again, all falling and swirling around him. He dreamt of strange places and magical things. He slept so deeply and wonderfully that when he woke up, the stable boys were already at work and the sun was slanting through the door and glinting on something small and round near his head. He sat up and rubbed his eyes and looked again, but the glint was still there in the hay, a gold coin. Without thinking, Beric lifted it to his mouth and bit it, but it was real, like real gold. Dazed, Beric could not believe his luck. The cloak and the acorn were obviously enchanted, and they helped him on his travels. He still walked a lot, but now he could get places much faster if he knew where he wanted to go. Over time, he put the acorn on a chain around his neck and wore the cloak almost all the time. He loved the freedom that this magic gave him, and he got to meet so many new people. One day, while wandering through an unfamiliar forest, Beric met a beautiful young woman who was collecting berries and herbs. He politely introduced himself and asked for her name, which was Aster. He offered to help her with her work, and together they set about gathering up what she needed. Aster explained all about the herbs they found and what they were used for, and Beric pointed out the different kinds of animal tracks. They laughed and talked as they went through the trees. Eventually, though, Aster had to head back to her campsite, and Beric offered to walk her there. When they arrived, they were met by a sharp-eyed woman who turned out to be Aster's mother. She just kept looking Beric up and down. Aster thanked him for his help in his company, and that is when Aster's mother invited him to stay for dinner. There was not much around for miles, and Beric just wanted to spend a few more hours with Aster, so he agreed. They all three laughed and talked and drank late into the night. Aster's mother insisted that Beric stay the night by their fire, and Aster and her mother both curled up on the other side of the campsite. That night, when Beric dreamed, he dreamed of Aster and the fun that they had together. Right before he could kiss her in, her in his dreams, he was woken up by her voice. "'Do you want to come with me?' she asked. "'I have such a long way to go. Do you see that place on that mountain over there?' She explained that she needed to get there for her mother who was ill. There was a hot spring and the waters would help to restore her, but it will take all day. I have already passed, packed us a lunch. I'd be happy to go with you, Beric replied, but I have a much better idea. May I? He stood close to Aster and held out his arm. She nodded and he looped his arm around her waist. He closed his eyes and wished that they were at the hot spring together. When he opened his eyes, Aster was laughing and she hugged and thanked him. Out of her pack, she pulled some bottles and filled them with warm water. Beric looked around. This was not only a hot spring, but the other pools around had warm water lined by moss and with toppling columns and small, colorful flowers. He went over to one of the larger pools and dipped his hand in and found warm, soothing water. He turned back to Aster and she smiled at him. Let's go swimming, she said. Beric could only nod back as she took off all but her bloomers and chemise, then slipped into the water. He stripped down to his britches and waded in after her. Together they splashed and played. When they got tired, Aster set up the lunch she had packed, and they talked and laughed as they shared the meal and laid in the sun. Before he knew it, Beric had fallen asleep, content and comfortable. But this time, Beric could not remember dreaming. It was cold when Beric woke with a start. He shivered and reached for his cloak, but then realized it was missing. He put his hand to his neck, and the acorn was missing too. His stomach dropped as he realized what had happened. She had taken them. Aster had tricked him. He hung his head in his hands, oblivious to the sounds outside the ruins that were creeping closer and closer. 
Hey there, why so glum? boomed a small-ish giant. I have been betrayed, Beric replied, barely glancing up. By who? the giant sat down heavily beside Beric, but he just shook his head. Please, the giant begged, and just would not stop. Beric finally relented and explained how he had gotten the cloak and the acorn in the first place, and then also how he lost them. Oh, I know that witch, the giant said. Aster's not a witch, Beric said. No, not her. Not yet, anyway, the giant said. I'm talking about her mother, and she cannot resist magical things. She has a spell that lets her see the magic potential of an object, but not what they actually do. It's very lucky you ran into me, the giant grinned. I can help you get revenge. Beric could not help but smile, just a little smile, and asked, How? The giant pulled out a parcel, and inside was a cabbage. This is a dazzling cabbage. It looks ordinary, but it is magical from my enchanted garden. Do not eat it yourself. Oh, and here, the giant plucked up an iron ring from the ground and chanted a spell. That will disguise you, but since it's not innate magic, it will only last for a day. Try it out. Beric slipped the ring on and looked at his reflection, and he almost didn't even recognize himself. Now, the giant continued, here's what you do. And he explained how to get his revenge and Beric's own magic back. How can I ever thank you for your help? Beric asked. Well, people think all giants are mean, and all the thanks that I want is for you to tell as many people as you can this story and explain how giants are people too. Some of us are mean, some of us are just nice, and want to mind our own business. I'm pretty sure, I, sure that I would already, Beric said. Seriously, how can I thank you? No need, the giant laughed. You'll want to follow that path there. So in the rising sun, Beric set off down the path, feeling better. He was proud of what he could remember about the plants and herbs that Aster had showed him. At least she had given him knowledge. Still, he longed for her to feel the dread that he had had when he awoke, alone and abandoned. Just after midday, he came upon the clearing and shouted a greeting. And Aster came into the clearing, too. But she looked sad, with red, swollen eyes like she had been crying. Beric, in his disguise, asked, May I share your fire? I have some food to pay for my stay. Yes, Aster sniffled, but my mother will be back soon. I would be gone before she returns if I were you. Are you all right? Beric asked, his heart softening just a little. He reached into his pack and handed her the dazzling cabbage. Not really, Aster responded. I think I need to get away from my mother. She does not trust anyone in... Well, you, sir, if she's around, keep anything precious close to you. Beric pressed her for details, and Aster finally relented. She explained to the stranger how she had met a nice young hunter who was so kind, but he had had some magic objects. Her mother had wanted the golden acorn that manifests a gold piece every night, but then she had also forced her to steal a magical cloak that takes her anywhere she wants to go from the kind hunter. Her mother's plan had been to leave him on a giant infested mountain to be killed, and she wistfully hoped that he was all right. Just as Beric opened his mouth to reveal himself for who he was and offer to take her far away from here, the mother appeared in the clearing. Oh, another guest, she cooed, and that cabbage smells delicious. I hope that some of it is for me. Hanging from her neck was the acorn, and from her shoulders was the brilliant blue cloak. Aster bowed her head again and passed out the bowls filled with cabbage and sausage. Her mother ate greedily, but Aster pushed the food around in her bowl. Her mother finished the bowl and started to ask Beric in disguise some questions. But as she talked, Beric could only stare at the hair sprouting all over her face and the ears that were getting pointier and pointier. What are you looking at? she demanded, looking down at her hands that were morphing into hooves. Heaving and hawing over what was happening, she started to panic. 
Beric slapped the bowl out of Aster's hands, and they both watched horrified as her mother turned into a donkey before their eyes. Beric turned to Aster and slipped off the ring the giant had given him. This had gone way too far. Aster gasped in surprise. I'm so sorry, he said. I don't know how to turn her back. I don't, I didn't know that this would happen. It's okay. It's okay, Aster said. I do. But what do we do? Beric asked. But she had already started to prepare. But she stopped suddenly. You know what we do? Aster said quietly, and Beric leaned closer to hear her over the panicked braying of her mother. We don't change her back. What? Beric exclaimed. If we change her back, we'll never be free, Aster said. Let's leave her as she is. So Aster harnessed and tied the donkey that used to be her mother to a nearby tree as she and Beric decided what to do. In the end, now that Beric had his treasures back, he decided to give Aster the necklace and asked her to travel with him. For a long time, they were very confused as to what to do about her mother. Together, they went to the giant's farm, and they sold her to the giant and asked him to care for her for the rest of her donkey life. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs>